Hey everybody. Uh, all right, today we are out here. We're gonna take a little tour of the Great Salt Lake. Uh, you might have seen some stuff in the news about the Great Salt Lake and how it is uh, drying up and uh, some of the impacts that that's gonna have on uh, us, the people that live in Utah and mostly the people that live along the Wasatch Front. Um, and uh, as you can see, I'm uh, out at a part of the lake that uh, really should be underwater right now. Uh, this is kind of the big mud flats out between uh, Bountiful over here and uh, Antelope Island back over here out in the lake. Antelope Island, which isn't an island, that's a theme you're gonna hear uh, several times today. Most of the islands are not islands. By the way, if you ever took off from uh, Salt Lake International, that's the tower, it's right in here somewhere, I can't see it in my phone. But basically the runways that take off from Salt Lake International are basically right over here, and most of the time they're taking off to the north, so they fly right over just like that jet just did right there. Um, so you can see, basically, out here right now, it's just, this is just a mud flat. This one, it's usually, it's shallow all the time, but if the, the lake is about 10 feet below where it normally would be, and, uh, so this would, would be flooded right now. Not right now, the lake level is about 4,190 feet. On average, historical average is 10 feet higher than this. Um, this right here is, is uh, probably not quite uh, 4,190. So, but still, if it were average depth, this would be, you know, at least, probably, I'd probably be up to my shoulders right here. Uh, the only thing out here right now, basically are just mud, and uh, some random tires, things like that. But one thing I just noticed, I've seen animals going between these tires and I've always wondered why. And I kind of wonder, well, that's kind of weird. Basically, little foxes and things like that. Use that as bathroom, I guess. There's fox poop in there. <laughs> I mean, if you need a little privacy out here, where else are you going to get it? There's nothing. I guess that's that's as good as you're going to get. So uh, anyway, we're going to start back up. I'm going to set the cameras up and then we're going to take off and we're going to fly uh, up towards Promontory Point. Uh, you'll see when we, when we get going. But uh, anyway, thanks for watching and... Uh, uh, this one, it's been a little bit long because the Great Salt Lake is pretty big. So uh, you're welcome to skip forward to parts that might interest you. And uh, anyway, thanks for watching. Okay. Ah, she started up beautifully. That's always a relief. There's a little bit of anxiety every time. I'm still, I'm, I'm like a person who survived a bad relationship. I'm just like, oh. How is it going to go today? Today, it went well. All right, we're just going to engage the rotor and uh, we'll be on our way. If you've not watched any of my previous videos, uh, basically we're flying today in an Enstrom F-28F. It's a 1997. Uh, they still make these uh, back in Menominee, Michigan. Uh, it's basically powered by a Lycoming uh, O360, but turbocharged, uh, so it produces 225 horsepower, uh, all the way up to uh, higher than the surface ceiling of the aircraft. So uh, it's a great helicopter to fly in around here. Here at the lake, uh, like I said out there, we're at about 4,200 feet. Uh, the lake level, surface level itself, uh, is 41.90 right now. Uh, right now it's June 20th. Uh, I think it was 41.90.5 today. Uh, and that is actually about four feet lower than it was two years ago at this time, about two feet lower than it was a year ago at this time. Typically, this is kind of like the high point of the uh, lake for the year. I mean, it, sh it should be a little higher right now because we're getting all the spring runoff and things like that from the big snows up in the mountains. We're not getting that this year. All right, everything looks good. And we'll be about ready to go here. We'll leave the uh, foxes and the birds to their little tire bathrooms out here.
Memphis bringing up this uh, control on my left arm is the uh, collective. It basically adds pitch. Uh, it's your up and down button, or your up and down lever, basically. It adds pitch to all the blades simultaneously. Um, so, you know, I pull this, we go up. I push it down, we go down. Um, you use this in conjunction with all your other flight controls, too. But here we go, we're on our way. Actually, while we're here, there's some little thing. It, uh, you can see all of these lines on this mud flat. I do not understand what some of them are. Some of them are like rocks that have been pushed around. Um, some of them, let me see if I can find this spot over here. Um, yeah, this is one of them. Okay, there's a line that basically stretches across this mud flat. It disappears if there's like fresh water that's come on it and kind of reflowed the mud, and then it pops up again. Okay, I would love somebody to tell me, what is this? What is this line? Like right now, this was kind of, looks like it was fairly re recently flooded. You occasionally see a few little animal tracks and things like that. What is this line? What's under here? Uh, over time, it will start getting like funny shapes, uh, breaks in the line. Uh, I have yet to figure out what, what that is. If there's like a cable or something under there, if there's something buried under here, I don't know what it is, but uh, I would like to know. Somebody's got to know. Okay, see, look at those lo those tracks. There's little tracks that go between all of the tires. What are those animals doing? Uh, I did just see a little kill deer land at one of those uh, tires over there, and maybe that's what they're looking for. Maybe there, maybe birds nest on the, the, in those tires. And so the foxes are looking for an easy meal, foxes and coyotes, and things like that. Uh, I don't know, but they definitely go from tire to tire, so there must be a reason. They must occasionally get a meal out of it, uh, or they wouldn't keep doing it. All right, cameras are rolling. Yep. Okay, so now this island off to the left, there's one little tiny channel of water uh, that flows between it. This is Antelope Island. It's the largest island on the lake. Antelope Island State Park, you can drive out there. It's super cool, it's very interesting. You can actually see antelope on the island. There are pronghorn antelope out there. Okay, there's another one of these uh, lines. I'm gonna divert for just a second. So the nose can see this. But do you see that line down there? It's kind of broken. Got a little jog in it right there. Somebody, some viewer, it's, this video is going to be all worth it if somebody gets on there and tells me what that is. Okay, anyway, that's Antelope Island out there. Uh, we're going to go around the lake and we're going to come back along the south shore of Antelope Island once we get all the way around. Uh, we're not going to go fully all the way around. I'd have to go up to the Bear River entry, uh, but we're going to go up here. We're going to take a quick look at the northwest, uh, northeast corner of the lake, then head around Promontory Point and head up that way. Um, and I'll try and keep it yeah, relatively low. We're about 800 feet right now, but I want you to be able to get a good look at the lake and, uh, you know, really get to see what this is all about. So right now, we're in what they call Farmington Bay. Obviously, not really a bay right now. Um, this little channel of water, I see a ton of little wading birds, little shorebirds uh, in there, some pelicans occasionally. Um, of course, seagulls. Seagull is the state bird of Utah. Uh, and. Uh, if you don't know why, it's because uh, in, suppose, the story is supposedly that uh, when the uh, Mormon uh, pioneers came into the valley in 1847, uh, one of the first years they had planted crops, but there was a Mormon cricket infestation, basically like a little locust, that was threatening, that was threatening to eat all the crops. But then the seagulls came in from the Great Salt Lake and ate all the crickets and saved the day. And uh, so 
Hence, the state bird is the seagull uh, in Utah. We also have a state bird of prey, which is the golden eagle. They just named that in one of the last legislative sessions, which I mean, it's a lot cooler bird. So uh, my vote is for the golden eagle. I mean, I don't have anything against seagulls. They're beautiful to watch. They're great flyers. They've got a beautiful wing, uh, but the golden eagle, I mean, can you compete with that? I don't think so. I mean, they live in, they travel south in the winter, they go all the way up to Alaska in the summertime. I mean, I feel like if I were to be reincarnated by an animal, I'm going, oh, I'm, I'm, I would strongly consider golden eagle if I had a choice. Uh, so anyway, here's this little, uh, uh, basically strip of water, very, very shallow. You could almost walk across it right there. Um, but it's basically all the, uh, that's the only bit of water that uh, separates Antelope Island from the rest of the Wasatch Front um, at the moment. Um, actually, uh, on the south end of the island is where the old causeway was uh, that we used to, where you used to be able to drive out to the islands this is many, many years, decades ago. But uh, that, you could still walk to Antelope Island uh, right now. Uh, without without getting your feet wet. So it's an island in name only at the moment. Uh, and that's typical, even if the island, even if the lake were not so low, so a lot of these islands would still not be islands all of the time. Stansbury Island over on the other side of the lake there uh, is an example of that. It's really uh, more of a peninsula, but if the lake is high, that one becomes an island. Um, the other thing that you can see out at Antelope Island, and we're coming up, we're getting closer to the causeway. You have to drive all the way up to uh, uh, Layton at Kaysville, and you take the uh, exit and you drive out on this causeway. Or as I used to do, we used to ride our bikes out here quite a bit. So it, they used to do it, the Salt Lake Century ride. You started downtown Salt Lake, you work your way all the way up here, you ride out the causeway uh, to Antelope Island, and you do a loop there on the roads on the north end and go all the way back, and that's 100 miles. Um, but it's a state park out here. Uh, you can camp out on the island, although this time of year, the bugs start getting pretty bad. Brine flies and little no and things like that. Um, so not the greatest time of year to go uh, stay out on uh, Antelope Island, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's really, really interesting. Um, there are buffalo. There's a large, a pretty large herd of buffalo out on the island. Uh, every year they do the buffalo roundup where uh, you know, the buffaloes have had a, lot of, a bunch of babies and uh, they need to manage the herd and keep it of a, a size that, uh, is, uh, that they, the island can handle. And uh, so they sell off some of the herd every year. But to get them into their pens, they, have, they start at the south end with a... Uh, large number of volunteers on horseback and you can actually if you have a horse you can volunteer and go do this uh, and they herd the buffalo all the way from the south end all the way to the north end and then they end up here we'll go over and look at the uh, buffalo pens where they end up but this is basically the very north end of the island there's the campground uh, that you can camp in right there there's trails, there's a trail, the Frary Peak Trail, that's the peak, highest peak on the island, it's called Frary Peak. Uh, that goes up to the uh, top of the mountain there, awesome trail. Just watch out for the buffalo, don't get close, it's like Yellowstone. Uh, people think they're pets, but they're not. And uh, they could be cranky and uh, irritating. There's an airplane uh, in our vicinity, about a mile away. Typically when I fly out here, honestly, I fly about 100 feet or less uh, just because it's fun. Uh, today, I want you to be able to get a look at the place uh, and see kind of this lake. Um, you know, my hope is that you might be able to, I don't know, when people see this on the news, see things about the Great Salt Lake on the news, I don't think people really have an idea of what, what is the Great Salt Lake? What does it look like? Uh, what's going on out there? A lot of people in Utah don't even know what's going on out here. It's amazing. So anyway, here's the island, Antelope.
I'm uh, looking for some buffalo. I'm not spotting them. A lot of times we might see them more on the end. A lot of times they're on the south side and they also seem to like the west side of uh, the island too, especially in the morning. But right here, these are the corrals that uh, they herd all the buffalo in. And you can kind of see a fence line. So when they do the buffalo roundup, you can come out here. A lot of people come out to watch and you'll see the herd of buffalo being moved around the corner. And, uh, oh, there's actually a fair number of them in the corral right down there right now. Uh, but they'll herd them around the corner, uh, bring them in here. They do veterinary health checks and things like that on them. And some of them are sold and, you know, maybe turned into a buffalo burger or two. And, uh, but it's pretty exciting to watch. And uh, the last time we went out and watched it was I think the year before last. And we're down there on that fence line. And uh, by the way, you can get a good burger right down there. It's, uh, this is the beach that you could go out and swim in, uh, which it, the beach has gone way out now, but that's uh, uh, kind of a fun day too. Uh, and they have a little cafe there. Uh, this is the visitor center for the Antelope Island State Park, just below us here. Uh, tons of wildlife out here. There's bighorn sheep up in the mountains right back there. There's owls, eagles, hawks, uh, all kinds of interesting things out on Antelope Island. So I definitely recommend checking it out if you ever have a chance. But anyway, back to my story. We were watching the buffalo being herded, herded in, and... Uh, all of these horses, they're volunteers, you know, they're not like uh, active, some of them probably are, but they're, a lot of them are just, you know, kind of people's pets. They're uh, uh, horses they have for fun because they love horses and they love riding. And some of them get quite tired chasing these buffalo around. Well, those buffalo are no dummies and they figured out that these horses chasing them are uh, getting worn out and uh, about 80 of these buffalo made a break for it. And all these guys on horseback are, you know, whipping their ponies, trying to catch up, and couldn't happen. They couldn't get around the front of them to head them off. So a good 80 buffalo just made for the hills and escaped and went all the way south again. And uh, we talked to a few of the guys that were riding, uh, and they were like, yeah, our horses are too wiped. We can't do it. We're gonna have to come back. Uh, later in the week and try and round them up again. But anyway, really fun, uh, fun day. All right, everything's looking good. This helicopter, the helicopter is flying great. Since my annual, I just did my 25 hour, uh, mostly loop job. It's like, you put grease, these things are greasy, greasy machines. They need a lot of grease. Uh, and lots of moving parts and they all need grease. And uh, so we just greased it all up and uh, flying nice and smooth. I was told when I bought this that uh, if it ever stops slinging grease, actually I asked him like, does it always sling grease? Sometimes you'll see a big glop of grease go right on the windshield or things like that. Like, will it always keep slinging grease like that? And uh, I was told that uh, if it stops throwing grease, you need to add more grease. So, you know, I feel good. I did that. I just added more grease. Now, uh, you might see a little bit. This is a mudflat leading out to Fremont Island. This is the second island of the day. Uh, Fremont Island has a super interesting history, and I'm going to do a whole video just on Fremont Island. We're going to go out there and land sometime. We're going to fly over it today. But you might remember this place, if you ever watched any uh, Diesel Brothers uh, YouTube channel, Dave Sparks, uh, they used to, for a couple of years, they owned this island out here, and they did a bunch of videos and stuff like that. Dave Sparks, when he was building his house up there on the Bountiful Bench, they came out here in trucks, and you kind of see the little bit of a road. It's sort of a road. I really wouldn't recommend driving on it unless you have some sort of Diesel Brothers type setup. But uh, uh, they would come out here and they went along the shore and they gathered uh, a bunch of old timbers. And those old timbers used to be part of the railroad trestle that crosses the lake. 
called the Lucent Cutoff. It was like a Union Pacific line uh, that basically goes across, and it's still in use today. We might even see a train if we're lucky. Um, but uh, it used to be built out of timbers. It was an actual trestle. Uh, and at the late 50s, I believe it was, they uh, demolished the uh, trestle and built an actual causeway. Um, and that effectively separated the north and south halves of the lake. Uh, the north half now has, is much saltier than the south half. Um, but a lot of those uh, timbers and things like that that ended up, that were part of the trestle before, uh, ended up all around the lake shore. They're all over the place. And so anyway, the Dave Sparks and crew, they went out here and uh, recovered a bunch of uh, timbers from all along this lakeshore right here, and then uh, milled them down and made them into beams of his house, which I thought was a pretty cool idea, really. Uh, it looks pretty good. Um, wait, this is, uh, we're just coming up on Fremont Island here. This one, uh, is uh what the third largest island of the lake uh we got antelope out there behind us we got stansbury off to the left there's carrington gunnison uh up there to the north and uh fremont here uh there are a bunch of other little ones that are like maybe they're islands maybe they're not um but at one point, this island, you can see a little cabin down there. This is the only structure on the island. There's a little cabin right here. And I don't know, but I suspect it was the same site that the original um, inhabitants... Uh, you know what, I'm actually seeing something I haven't really noticed, because I usually come in here real low. But uh, uh, there was a family that lived out here in the late 1800s. Uh, they lived on the island for six years. and. Uh, uh, the wife of the uh, couple, they had, uh, I think, four kids out here. She wrote a book about her experiences out here. Um, and uh, uh, it was pretty interesting. And actually, the husband uh, had tuberculosis. Uh, he actually passed away out here, and they're actually buried out here. And I found the uh, gravesite. Right below us is, the, uh, is a little bush plane landing strip. Right on this ridge line, people in uh, Cubs, Super Cubs, and my dad used to do this in his old Pacer, uh, will come out here and land right along that little strip uh, uh, on top of the island. And, uh, you know, my dad, he, he'd come out here, he was camping out here in the 80s. And, uh, um, and it's kind of a cool, it's kind of a cool spot. They've put a little windsock right down there. We're just flying over it right now. Um, there didn't used to, prior to the Diesel Brothers owning this thing, there didn't used to be any uh, tracks or roads up here. They did kind of carve in a couple of them right there. Uh, but uh, other than that, there's not much out here. And when, the, uh, when they got it back, now it's, I believe, in some kind of trust between the Nature Conservancy and uh, the state. And uh, for a while there, they, and actually when the Diesel Brothers owned it, they banned anybody from landing out here which kind of bumped me out because this was sort of one of my go-to spots. It's just a beautiful, peaceful, interesting place where you can get away from everybody. You know, no one's on this island. Uh, usually, 99% of the time, you're the only one out here. And uh, it's just peaceful. It's interesting. Anyway, Diesel Brothers, they banned us from flying out here. Now the state is back and they've got a conservation uh, arrangement. and. Uh, the Utah Backcountry Pilots Association negotiated uh, with them for permission to basically land on these two strips, the one back there that we passed and this one right down here. This one's down along the lakeshore. Uh, this is the flatter of the two, uh, the better runway. You can land different kinds of planes on this one, probably. It's still, it's a dirt strip. It's kind of a bush strip. Or it's real narrow and, uh, you know, you wouldn't land, I wouldn't land my Mooney out here, but, uh, but you could land a few different things, and kind of a neat place. So I'm glad they were able to negotiate that. I'm glad that we can land out here again. Um, you can only land at those spots, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, it's all right. It's it's good. It's it's. I'm glad that 
that the, we have permission to do it. And I'm glad the island is preserved, too. Um, so there's Fremont Island. We're just coming out of the other side. You can probably see in a few of the spots along the old shoreline uh, where the uh, some of those timbers are all washed up. You know, even, the, even two years ago, none of the mud flats that extend out from the island here were visible. Um, now we're just going to cross this little channel right here. We're at 5,300 feet, so we're almost 1,100 feet above the surface of the lake. We will go do some low-level stuff, too, at some point on this trip, just because it's cool and I, and I like it. Now we're crossing this little channel right here. The whole lake is very, very shallow. The deepest part of the lake is between Stansbury Island and uh, Antelope Island back there. But still, even uh, at its deepest, uh, on, at a normal uh, depth, the average depth, it's 35 feet deep at its deepest. Now, that would be it's 10 feet low. Uh, that's only 25 feet at its deepest. So it's a very, very shallow uh, lake. Um, we're coming up on, this is a, uh, basically a little harbor for brine shrimpers. Um, one of the biggest industries out of the lake is that, uh, you know, there are no fish in the Great Salt Lake. Uh, it's way too uh, salty for that. The only uh, things that live in the lake are, you know, algaes, bacteria, uh, viruses and things like that. Uh, but brine shrimp, these little tiny shrimp, and uh, they, you can actually see them in almost mats and stuff in some areas of the lake. Well, uh, down in this little harbor right here, which, uh, they've got all the boats pulled out. Actually, the boats are, if you look at the harbor and then you look straight up, the boats are on dry dock. They're sitting up there uh, out of the water. There's some white little tanks, and then there's uh, seven boats, no, eight boats right there. Those are brine shrimping boats. So the, those boats go out there, and uh, I think now they use drones, but you, they used to employ pilots, and there's actually a little airstrip right here, and that was for the uh, brine shrimp spotters. They would go out there, and the boats would go out, and then the spotters would go and direct them towards these uh, areas of high concentrations of uh, brine shrimp, and they would harvest that brine shrimp and it's a multi-billion dollar industry. This shrimp is used for uh, fish food and all kinds of other things. And uh, it's one of the things that is threatened by uh, the lake levels going down. Because as the lake level goes down, uh, the uh, water that remains becomes saltier. At some point, it will become too salty for the brine shrimp to survive. And uh, if that happened, that would be a major ecological uh, catastrophe because those brine shrimp, uh, this area is a stopover point for millions of migrating birds. And they eat the brine shrimp and they eat uh, the flies that uh, survive on dead brine shrimp all along the shore, uh, brine flies, uh, their larvae and things like that. This is basically a, just a big huge feasting ground for brine shrimp. By the way, we also just passed over the causeway. I'm going to turn it out this way so you can get a look. That is the now causeway. It used to be a trestle for, uh, uh, was Union Pacific Railroad. I don't know, I'm sure others use it. They, I'm sure they have some kind of arrangement, but uh, that uh, is a big east-west line um, on the railroad here. We're going west right now. But you can see how the lake is uh, divided in two, essentially. And up until, uh, I think it was only about less than 10 years ago, don't quote me on that, but uh, that they, uh, they actually widened the gaps that they had allowed water to flow between the two halves. At one point, the north half was much, much lower than the uh, south half. And uh, so the south half ends up getting more of the inflows from the rivers. The lake is fed by three main rivers. There's the Bear River that comes off the Uinta Mountains to the uh, east. Uh, and then uh, the Weber River, which also starts in the Uintas, but goes through the Wasatch. 
and uh, then the Jordan River that comes out of Utah Lake, which is a lake just to the south. Uh, it's where Provo, Salt Lake City is here. There's a point of the mountain, and then uh, Utah Lake, which is a large freshwater lake in uh, Utah Valley to the south. Uh, that lake uh, has an outlet. It is fed by the Provo River, has an outlet that is the Jordan River. The Jordan River flows into the Great Salt Lake. You can see the channel that they've dug in here for uh, maintenance boats and things like that to service this uh, causeway, but um, these shapes of the salt, uh, these little almost interesting geometric structures that are just created by um, these bacterial mounds uh, that you can kind of see built up on there are super interesting. And right ahead of us here, you get a good view of what happens between the south lake and the north side of the lake. The south side of the lake, you can see it's much more blue. The north side of the lake has this pink hue to it. Like, and I'm not talking a little bit pink. It's very, very pink, pinkish red. And uh, that's because on the north side of the lake, it's much, much saltier than the south side of the lake. And uh, so, Different uh, bacteria and algaes and things like that grow on the north side of the lake that have that uh, interesting color to them. So here's the railway causeway, heads out off, off to the uh, west there. So now we're going to turn back north again. Uh, you can see the winds whip up this foam, this salty foam on the lake. Um, and. Uh, on windy days, that foam, it's its a strange texture. Um, it gets whipped up and pushed up along the shore, uh, but I guess it's like sea foam. Um, but uh, it's strange. It, it will whip up, it will pile up. Um, you know, on, when, when you get bad weather out here, the waves can get quite big on this lake. You know, it's a large area and the wind can go, has a lot of area to work with. And, uh, you know, people have talked about 10-foot waves and things out here during storms. Um, you know, right now, the marina actually for the lake, which is on the south end of the lake, is closed. It's, uh, they had to tell everybody to get out, uh, pull their boats out, uh, because their access to the main lake is uh, too shallow. You can't actually uh, launch your boats in it. Um, So, unfortunately, there's not a lot of boating on the lake right now, but, uh, you know, some of the stories of people in the old days on uh, going out on the lake, uh, even actually not that long ago, uh, there was a uh, crane. There used to be a crane. This was another recent uh, Diesel Brothers re recovery video where they went out there and removed this crane that had been stuck in the lake since, uh, I guess, the 80s. I used to always go out there and check it out just because I found it interesting that it, this thing was stuck in the mud. But apparently it, it got there uh, by a barge um, that was, I don't know what the reason was they were taking this crane out there, but it was on a flat-bottomed barge. Storm came up, uh, tipped over, dumped the crane into the lake, and there it stayed all the way up until about two months ago when the Diesel Brothers went out there and recover, recovered it and pulled it out of there. Uh, kind of an interesting video. Maybe I'll link to that one in the show notes. You can check it out. Um, and uh, anyway, now we're going up. This is Promontory Point. Uh, this is uh, a little point of land. On the other side of the lake is the what they call the North uh, East quadrant of the lake. That is separated off by the causeway. Uh, there are a lot of evaporation ponds and things like that over there that they use for salt harvesting. Um, but it also has no, uh, no outlet, but it is fed by the Bear River. The Bear River comes down through the mountains there and there is a large area of estuaries uh, that's, that's uh, you know, either freshwater or semi-salty. Um, what do they call that? Do they call it brine? Um, that uh, also uh, huge wildlife, uh, big bird migration, stopover point. Um, it's uh, actually a feeding ground 
out here to the uh, my left, if you look out across there, you can see the other side of the lake. A little bit in is another island. That island is called Gunnison Island. And at times, and I'm not sure if they're out there now, uh, that is the nesting ground and has been the nesting ground for uh, a large portion of the uh, American white pelicans in North America. They nest out on that island. It's a perfect place for them. Uh, but in order to feed, uh, they make a daily flight from out there all the way across 30 miles over to the estuary, the Bear River estuary, and feed over there and then fly all the way back and then they have their nests out on Gunnison Island, which I imagine is a pretty good spot to stay away from predators. Um, but there, all of that is threatened uh, now because of uh, the lake levels are so low that it's no longer an island and so they're traditionally a protected spot is not so protected anymore. You can kind of see, uh, at some point I'm going to come up here and do a video just of the spiral jetty only and we'll do it on a cloudy day because on a cloudy day you really can see the dark uh, red deep tones of the lake and uh, uh, my battery's done and uh, you know when their blue sky is out it's beautiful also but uh, uh, the color doesn't come out quite as much no, I'm just I'm just climbing away I'm all the way up to 6,000 now I'm gonna go back down a little bit so you can get a closer look but this is promontory point uh, most of it is privately owned. It's ranch land and things like that. Some of it is uh, BLM land. Uh, but to the north, just a little farther north up there, is um, the Golden Spike uh, Monument. And it's basically where the joining point of the Transcontinental Railroad uh, happened. Uh, so, you know, and I, I should have looked it up, but I don't, I don't remember the dates that this happened. It had to be what in 18. I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess here. I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna say 1868. Maybe that's a little late. I'm gonna say 1868 is when they, uh, there was a uh, railroad being built from the west coast and an, a railroad being built from the east coast and uh, they met up right here, just to the north of these little mountains right here. The railroads met. That was the first railroad line across uh, the United, the, the, across North America. And uh, to, when the two railroads met, they, the last uh, railroad spike that they drove in was supposedly made of gold. So they called the Gold Spike uh, Monument. And uh, I was thinking about calling them up. I bet you if I uh, got permission, they might let me fly up there and land and go to the museum. You can see there's a, there are some freshwater springs that come off of these mountains here. There's a little bit of marshy area over here. I can see some cattle uh, grazing over there. It really doesn't seem like it'd be a great grazing uh, area, but there is there are a couple of uh, ranchers up here. Uh, that have cattle. Uh, you know, all of this, this is also uh, a bay, uh, technically, um, but a bay that has turned into not so much a bay anymore. Um, you could see all of those little mounds and things like that, those are made by uh, bacteria, and there's uh, some, of, some of the places along here these structures that are in the lake are, I've been told, are similar to some of the earliest structures on Earth. They're uh, very similar to the early bacteria, bacterial uh, structures and things like that found in the fossil record and some of the, some of the earliest life on Earth. And uh, so, you know, just interesting from a uh, Ecological perspective, historical perspective. You can see some of them. They make interesting patterns. You can see that pink color to the ponds and the green. I 
It's a fascinating place. I've seen... I've seen coyotes. I, I've not seen a lot of animal life out here because... Why would they come out here? I really don't know. But uh, I have seen coyotes run, uh, a coyote running across here one time. Oh, we're going to go down a little bit lower. We're going to fly by, uh, and we're getting toward, up towards the northern end of the lake now. Um, and we're going to fly past uh, one notable feature up here. People come from all over to uh, check this thing out. Uh, it's the Spiral Jetty. And it was made by uh, an artist called Robert Smithson. Um, and he used the local lava rock to build a jetty out into the lake. Um, you'll see it here in maybe another minute. Um, and it's an interesting, just a landscape architecture sculpture. Um, and also a, <laughs> a fun place to take people from out of town because it's such a bizarre and unusual environment up here. Honestly, it feels like you're on another planet or something like that. I mean, right now, I know there may be some people up here, but I can't see any human beings anywhere. And uh, yet, there are three million people that live back where, uh, along the Wasatch Front. So it's not hard to uh, get away from people out here in the West. Uh, and when you take people out to the spiral jetty, it's just an interesting art structure because it's this uh, form, a definitive form in the middle of kind of nothingness that stands out so much. Uh, the contrast is amazing. And uh, I don't know, people come from all over the world to check it out. A lot of people in Utah have never been up to it. It's kind of a drive. It's like... Uh, it's probably uh, maybe three hours to drive up to this from uh, Salt Lake because uh, you got to go up north. You'll go past the Golden Spikes. You can make a day of it. Go up there, go to the Golden Spike Monument, then come down. You'll drive down this dirt road. Uh, oh, now I see a guy. I see uh, somebody driving down that dirt road back to the north. Um, and then uh, come out to the jetty here. Take a picnic. Now you can kind of see it coming into view. I'm not going to stop here and spend a lot of time because I'm going to do another video just on the spiral jetty. And we're going to come up here and land and get out and walk around and check it out. Um, but I can see one car that my favorite time to come up to the spiral jetty is when we've had a storm because the moat that road gets all muddy and not great to drive down and uh, the lake looks magical when uh, there's you know darker clouds and it's riled up and there's foam and uh, you know some, sh some shadows and things like that it's just it's beautiful up here and then and if you come up on a day like that there's not there won't be anybody up here and there's only three cars here right now so you know it's not like it's a crowd but there's the spiral jetty kind of do got to watch out for drones up here because people like to take drones up and take pictures of the spiral jetty i don't blame them that's what i would like to do but uh you can land there's a great landing spot for a helicopter right down there what I do and it's right some of this land is privately owned but actually the from the old lakeshore out is state land and uh, from what I understand there's a runway up here somewhere to an old uh, old runway but uh, I don't know where it is I'm actually that little stretch of road right there is perfectly straight. That might be it. We're coming up. We can actually, I can see the northern extent of the lake right now. 
Uh, this north end has really shrunk it back. I don't know if that is, you know, technically a runway, but it certainly could be used as one. Got a pretty good tailwind right now, so we're going to be fighting a little headwind going back. We'll probably go up here and cut across and uh, head back up to uh, maybe over to uh, Carrington Island uh, right now. But let me, let me climb up a little bit so you can get a good look at the northern end of the lake before I head back that way. And I also got to pull up my uh, chart a little bit just to make sure I catch the uh, restricted area. Oh yeah, I got it. Okay, we'll climb up and give you a good view of the north end of the lake. This increasingly narrow little spit of water uh, gets smaller every time I come by, but it really should be. Anywhere you see that lighter uh, colored mud, it should be more along those lines right now. Yeah, this will be good. We'll climb up here and then we'll head out across the lake. It'll be good. We'll give ourselves a little extra glide if we uh, have to ditch. Yo, okay, Guppy. Just, I'm not, I'm what, uh, 75% power, 80% power. Climb at a thousand feet a minute. Climbing through 6,500. That means we are about. Uh, we're coming. We're gonna go right past uh, 4,500 feet in the air. We'll maybe go. All, let's go up to a mile up. We'll go up. Uh, Let's see, 42,000, we'd have to go up to 9,400. We'll do that. All right, now, at that front camera. Now, what we're going to need to do, though, we're going to need to land and swap our camera batteries out here in a minute. All right, so there we get a good look. That's the northern end of the lake. That's the extent of the lake there. We're still recording. Not a whole lot. You know, on uh, on paper, if you look out over, if you look at my little chart here, we should be over the water right now. Should be a fairly large bay up here, but that's it. This is shrinking uh, very, very quickly. All right, now we're gonna head over here towards Gunnison Island. We're turning south now. You can get a pretty good view of the whole lake from up here, actually. There's Antelope Island way off in the distance. There's Stansbury Island down there.
and you can see that sea foam down there. Pretty good waves, actually, on the lake right now. Probably be a pretty good uh, day for sailing. You know what's funny? The wind up here, we're at 7,300 feet. The wind up here is from uh, southwest. The waves on the lake uh, appear to be going uh, to the northwest, indicating the winds from this way. That's what the uh, foam looks like as well. Uh, so that's about, uh, what, uh, 120 degrees different between this altitude and down there. Even though this lake has shrunk, it's still quite impressive. Just the sheer size of it. Oh, and by the way, um, the Bonneville Salt Flats, so you can see straight ahead of us, this is the edge of the lake right here. But beyond that, uh, there's a couple other little mountain ranges. And then beyond that, you can see some white way off in the distance. That is the Bonneville Salt Flats. That's where they've set the world land speed records and things like that. They have races out there on that salt pan. That salt pan was laid down over eons by uh, uh, this, uh, this lake. About 10,000 years ago, this entire basin was filled with an enormous, enormous lake called Lake Bonneville. And Lake Bonneville uh, at its height, if you look at any of these uh, mountains that surround this lake and in the Salt Lake Valley, anywhere really in Utah, because this lake extended way, way down into central Utah, up, up north into Idaho. Uh, and on all the mountains in this area, you'll see these horizontal lines, uh, benches along the mountains. Those were the old lakeshore lines of uh, the ancient, the old uh, Lake Bonneville. And, uh, you know, it was about 10,000 years ago is all that uh, that lake existed. So there were actually people that uh, lived along the shores of Lake Bonneville. Uh, and uh, there were actually caves and things like that along some of these shores. And uh, people have found uh, artifacts and interesting uh, you know, items. You can see uh, there's a real neat exhibit up at the uh, Utah Museum of Natural History. Uh, I think it's on the fourth floor. They've got a lot of uh, uh, just some things showcasing the indigenous peoples of uh, uh, Utah. And a lot of them, if you look at the exhibits, uh, the descriptions, they will say, you know, these items were found in a cave along the uh, shores of the old Lake Bonneville. And uh, so if you look out straight ahead, you can see on all of these mountains, any mountain you look at around here, you'll see those old shorelines. Which I just think is interesting to think about because what must this have looked like then? I mean, we get what they call lake effect snow, where a lot of our weather comes from the northeast uh, and you, the wet weather that we get. Uh, so when we're getting storms that make for the great Utah skiing. It's coming from the northeast. It flows across the lake here. It picks up extra moisture as it's, as it's, uh, the air is going across this lake. And then it gets squeezed out as the air flows over the top of the Wasatch Mountains, you know, whose peaks are up, you know, 11,000 foot peaks from 4,200 4, feet down here. And uh, we get this beautiful, light, dry powder snow that uh, is fantastic to ski in. And they call it the lake effect. And it basically adds to our snowpack. What, well, what must the lake effect have been like with Lake Bonneville? 
you know, a lake that was many, many, many times the size of this lake. I mean, it had to have been incredible. Ultimately, that lake drained. There's a, up on the Snake River, there's a canyon. You can actually see uh, the canyon that eventually eroded and basically popped the drain on this lake and massive amounts of water flowed out of this lake uh, to the Pacific Ocean down through the Snake River. Some of the canyons out there are just scoured. Uh, I can already see some birds flying around this. Straight ahead of us, this is Gunnison Island. Gunnison Island uh, was named for uh, basically one of the people that uh, explored the, uh, the lake first. The first. Some of the first people, we, we already passed over Fremont Island, but Fremont Island was na is named for John C. Fremont. John C. Fremont uh, was tasked with, uh, by the American government with coming out here and surveying the, uh, the area. And so he, they came out with a party of 18 men uh, and uh, actually took a boat out to Fremont Island. And he documented this. This was in 1843. It's four years before the Mormon pioneers came to Salt Lake Valley. So the only people that, you know, living here at the time were uh, the Utes, uh, Shoshone, um, Paiute peoples. And uh, Fremont came through here and uh, they took a boat out to Fremont Island. Uh, Kit Carson, kind of a famous uh, Western uh, trapper, uh, was with them. And uh, uh, they landed out, they went out to Fremont Island. Well, uh, uh, after that, the next uh, group to really survey the area was uh, Stansbury, Howard Stansbury, uh, and that was in 1850. His second in command uh, was, uh, uh, I believe it was John Gunnison, and this island is named for him. And this is the island that is the uh, nesting ground for uh, thousands of American white pelicans. And I don't know what their nesting uh, time period is. I would imagine it'd be kind of over now, but uh, I don't see a lot of birds out there right now. There was a guy that uh, lived, I mean, I'm staying fairly high. If there are, bird, if there are birds here, uh, you know, this is a bird sanctuary. I don't want to disturb them, so I'm going to stay plenty high above this. But uh, I'm trying to get a look and see if we can see them. But no, I'm not seeing a lot of them. You know, there's other birds, and uh, seagulls, and all kinds of things. Oh, you know what? I do see some uh, birds flying around down there. I'm, yeah, I see a lot of seagulls. I'm not seeing a lot of... Uh, Pelicans, or really any pelicans. But I do see a lot of seagulls. Oh, nope, you know what? I do see pelicans. I see uh, birds nesting on the ground. Well, that's good. I'm glad there are still pelicans out there. I can see large white dots. Yep. Oh, good. Well, birds are still nesting out on, Carrington, on uh, Gunnison Island. That's good. I'm glad to see that. Uh, that John Gunnison, by the way, who that island is named for, uh, he met his end uh, just a few years later in 1853. Uh, he'd come back. They, the uh, uh, Stansbury survey expedition had uh, successfully concluded, and uh, he then got a new task. He was supposed to be finding a route for uh, the railroad. I'm going to have to cut around this restricted area out here. It's kind of a gunnery range for uh, F-35s out of Hill Air Force Base. Uh, I'm going to have to cut out around here a little bit. Uh, but, uh, and I kind of want to land out here and swap out my batteries to find a good spot. Uh, but he was basically with a group uh, surveying 
uh, to the south, near what the present day town of Delta, Utah. Uh, there's a Sevier Lake, it's called. It's also a kind of dried up uh, end point for water flows uh, that uh, ends up, it's really mostly, sometimes there's water in it, sometimes there's not. Anyway, they were near there, and about that time, there was a conflict going on between the Mormons and the local uh, populations, indigenous populations, uh, the Utes, and uh, his band uh, had split up between two groups. One had gone south along the Sevier River, one had gone north, and uh, his group was attacked, and... Uh, uh, of the 11 people there, two survived. He was one of the ones killed. And uh, anyway, then there was a controversy, controversial uh, theory that that uh, maybe uh, they actually investigated whether it was actually Mormons uh, pretending to be uh, Utes that had attacked the uh, survey team. But ultimately, they concluded that it was not. But it was a bit of a mystery there. They actually appointed a special investigator to determine that. Um, now, this looks... I'm going to see just how wet this is. Might be too wet. head right over here to the edge of the restricted area and uh, set this down and swap out our batteries. land over here is just uh, outside. This, these uh, little rises are just outside the restricted area. Occasionally you will see uh, F-35s uh, dispatched out of uh, Hill and you'll watch them go fly across and when they appear on my little uh, ADSB, it kind of looks like a little radar tracker. Uh, there's a line that comes out of them uh, that uh, indicates relative speed. And when an F-35 is coming across there, whoo, that line is very long. It's, you definitely, it gets your attention. Set it down over here somewhere. Like an old canal. Dug out. To feed some of the evaporation ponds over there. There's a big industry off just a little farther to the west of us. Uh, using evaporation ponds to extract salts and things like that out of the... Uh, yeah, this looks pretty good the salts out of the uh, the water. So they pump water over there and then uh, evaporate it out. I see some ATV trucks and things like that, but Okay, I'm just going to swap out these batteries and then uh, we'll be right back.
Uh, we lost our uh, battery on our other camera up here. Not too bad. Not too uh, dusty. They drove an ATV out here. All right, now we're just gonna go out and cut around the, uh, the uh, restricted area here, and uh, we'll be heading back. We're almost about to cross back into the south end of the lake. We're on the other side of that causeway uh, that we saw when we were over on Promontory Point over there. It's a nice day. Well, we confirmed there are still pelicans out on Darrington uh, Island. Unfortunately, I think my battery on my front camera might have died before we got to Carrington Island, so I don't know if we'll, you'll actually be able to see that or not. Okay, here we are. Here's the last of our north end of the island. I've noticed that the island seems to make its own weather sometimes. And that the winds seem to flow out from the center of the lake, sometimes no matter which way you go. So like, uh, So you, you know, right now, the wind is blowing from the east right here. Clearly the waves are being, uh, you know, pushed to the west. And, uh, but then up there, they were being pushed to the northeast a lot at lake level. Uh, even though the prevailing wind up higher was from the west. Uh, you know, up above us, the wind was almost completely the opposite direction of this right here. Um, so I feel like the lake, maybe somebody can verify for this for me. If you're watching this and you know how this works, tell me. Uh, but it seems like there's a cooling effect. The lake, the air is uh, dropping down and then ends up kind of being pushed out from the lake on all sides. Um, We'll just continue climbing up here. All of our temps look good. Oil pressure is good. We're headed now towards uh, Carrington Island and then Stansbury Island. Uh, Carrington was, uh, I believe he was the uh, personal secretary of uh, 
Brigham Young and the Stansbury uh, expedition was uh, coming out here in uh, 1850. So the uh, uh, Mormon settlers had been here for three years at that point. They came out in 1847. Uh, supposedly there were some initial suspicion, concern about the Stansbury coming out here. Uh, they thought it might be, you know, some sort of preliminary plot against the scouting out the uh, yeah, pioneers here, because they'd had a lot of conflicts with the U.S. government before. And uh, so uh, Sansbury, though, went and met with Brigham Young. Brigham Young was the leader of the LDS uh, church there, and, uh, um, and the leader of the church when they settled in uh, the Salt Lake Valley. He met with Brigham Young, and Brigham Young then, you know, told them that this was a purely scientific expedition. So then Brigham Young assigned his personal secretary, uh, Albert Carrington, to accompany them on their uh, journey. And he did, and uh, contributed uh, to the whole expedition. He ended up going back to Washington to report their findings after the uh, expedition was over. And, uh, um, this island was named for him. Carrington Island, as I, I always thought it was a seagull rookery as well. But uh, I think since then, I think I had uh, confused with uh, uh, Gunnison Island, the one we just passed. Carrington Island, I believe, is mostly BLM land. Um, and you can kind of see the uh, layers of lakeshore. You know, definitely when Lake Bonneville was full, Carrington Island would have been completely submerged. Yeah, and even as we've climbed up, so we've only climbed up uh, you know, 800 feet or so, 700 feet, and now our wind um, up here is a little more quartering, uh, where on the lake it looks like it's a little more from this direction. Uh, I don't know, kind of interesting. I'm going to be sad if I get back and uh, all of the uh, footage is uh, Uh, not there because uh, my batteries died. <laughs> uh, okay, I've got somebody coming up behind me here. One mile out. I'm thinking it's Todd. Traffic, 7 o'clock, same altitude, yeah. less than one mile. Yep, it's Todd. <laughs> so Todd apparently went flying and decided to come uh, visit, and here he is off to the left. <laughs> uh -huh. Todd, are you up on fingers? I sure am. <laughs> How you doing? Good, what's up, buddy? I've been trying to get a hold of you. I saw, I just landed back I just landed back there to swap my batteries out, and I saw that you texted, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm doing a tour of the lake video. Oh, you want me out of it? No, no, you're entertaining. This is kind of a boring stretch in here. I, I noticed <laughs> you're following the restricted, huh? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just uh, skirting the edge of it. I'm headed towards uh, Carrington Island here. I was going to hit Carrington. Strand Stansbury and then cut back across uh, Antelope and back. Well, I'm trying to slow down so you can catch up. I don't know if it's working though. <laughs> Not really. Let's see here. Let me put more effort into it. Yeah, I just threw some flaps in. I'm doing 90 indicated miles an hour. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm. My true airspeed is 99. 
You should catch me. Is this Carrington, Carrington straight ahead? Yeah, this is Carrington straight ahead to the right. I, oh, I flew over uh, Gunnison Island fairly high and uh, I wanted to see if the pelicans were actually st roosting there and they are. I was pretty high, but you can see these white dots on there. Oh, cool. Okay, we're clear at the end of the restricted area. I just figured I'd stay outside of you so I didn't drift into it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. I saw that uh, dot closing and I'm like, either there's somebody from Hill who has been scrambled to intercept me or it's Todd. <laughs> No, I scoped you out and figured I'd catch you. <laughs> Are you catching up, or am I still too fast? Uh, I'm drifting. I'm off to your right. I'm, I'm slightly caught up. I'm off to your right. I've caught up just a little bit. I kind of gotta, I gotta go fairly slow anyway, cause uh, I can't power, I can't uh, blow through my gas. Traffic, oh. 11 o'clock. Don't change anything on my account, I just came to say hey. No, no, that's cool. Your plane looks nice. Well, it looked nice for a minute ago before I was all covered with bugs. So I was gonna sneak up underneath you coming across the causeway, but you turned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I went up uh, past Spiral Jetty, up to checked out the north end of the lake, and then, uh, yeah, cruised around, flew, flew over Gunnison, uh, and then uh, stopped back there just north of the causeway and swapped the batteries out. I'm going to swing around uh, to the left of 360. Think up. Sounds good. There's more of those uh, interesting structures down below us. Oh, sure shallow out here. It's so shallow. It's crazy. A year, a year ago, all of this was underwater. I'm, uh, I hit the button while I'm narrating my uh, video. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's so nice out today. The temperature is perfect. Absolutely perfect. It's nice for it to cool down a little bit. Huh? Super nice. There's a name for this island too. I don't remember what it is. Uh, oh boy, there's a large number of birds. I'm not gonna bother them too much. Wow, wow that's a large amount of seagulls, it looks like. Oh, that's the island that is the seagull nesting ground. Wow, and it sure is too. Holy cow. There are thousands of seagulls on that island. Wow, that island down there? Uh, that is apparently the seagull nesting ground because there, are, there must be thousands of seagulls on that little island right there. Holy crap, I'd say it is. There's seagulls all over the place. Yeah, tons of them. Now we're coming up on Carrington Island. The island beyond this one with the larger mountains, that's the second largest island on the Great Salt Lake, uh, Stansbury Island. Named for Stansbury. Stansbury Expedition. 
I think his first name is Howard. Howard Stansberry. Back on uh, Gunnison Island. Uh, the Gunnison Island is, you can't land there. You can't, no one can go out there. It's owned by the state. It's restricted access. Um, and uh, mainly for the bird rookery. But uh, apparently it, you, online, I'll may find a link to it posted on the, uh, in the notes, but uh, uh, there was a structure that they built for triangulation, triangulation for uh, surveying out here that was built by Stansbury uh, in 1850. Apparently it's uh, still in actually pretty good shape to this day on the top of the island there. I see what looks to be animal tracks. I would be, I don't know what their source of water would be out here. If there's, I wonder if there's a spring on this island? I don't believe there is. Actually, you know, I read uh, online that there was a guy that moved out here, the one to, uh, was going to uh, establish a little homestead on the island, and he drilled a well, but his well only uh, would produce salt water. Uh, so that was the end of uh, that was the end of that. Oh, there goes Todd over on the You look fast cruising along the water there. I got pulled back. I'm <laughs> I couldn't see it, so I just stayed out this way. I'm uh, just over the uh, south edge of Carrington now. I mean, I got you on ADSB, but I couldn't see you when I came up on you. Right. Now, this, uh, these big ponds off to the right, this is... Uh, a large evaporation area where they harvest magnesium and uh, salt and things like that. There's a, off this way is uh, U.S. magnesium, which is uh, the largest magnesium producer in the Western Hemisphere. Also, unfortunately, one of the largest polluters in the Western, in uh, the United States in terms of air pollution. Todd's um, right off of our nose, cruising along Stansbury there. But basically, to produce magnesium in large quantities, you really need salt beds. So I guess uh, the only other place in the Western Hemisphere that is good for uh, getting magnesium is uh, uh, some place in Chile. So I'm sure there is a strategic and economic uh, incentive for maintaining this uh, system. I just wish that they would uh, work a little harder on uh, their emissions because uh, it doesn't look too bad today, but some days you'll come out here and uh, this whole area will be just filled with uh, some pretty nasty air pollution. And all of that flows directly downwind to the uh, Salt Lake Valley. Todd disappeared on the other side of uh, Sansbury there. This uh, water over here, because it's basically an evaporation pond, also uh, tends to get uh, very brightly colored pink. There was another uh, little port for the uh, brine shrimpers out over here as well, but uh, it looks a little too shallow to me. I'm not sure they'd be able to get in and out of that. Uh, at one point, there was a YouTube, uh, or actually uh, TikTok and Instagram, um, thing where uh, people were being filmed uh, floating a kayak right down a canal out in here, and it has 
you know, of course, the brilliant colors on either side, and then the canal itself is salty underneath, so it gives, uh, looks like a turquoise blue, um, you know, kind of went viral, uh, people kayaking down us, some drone shots of it, but uh, it's really not a great place to do that, <laughs> but uh, not to mention it's not uh, public property, but yeah, you can see them pumping uh, water out into that evaporation pond. on the road here. This island, basically the north end of the island uh, and the shorelines on either side are privately owned. This road is a private road, but the inside is uh, BLM land. You can't really get to it, but uh, it is uh, federal public lands uh, for most of the island. On the south end of this island, there are some petroglyphs, which I have not actually gone to. My mom and her hiking group went out there not long ago and checked them out. But uh, I would bet there probably are other petroglyphs around the island as well. Might get some bumps as we climb up over this. But so when you look at this, hey, you land up there. Uh, I probably won't. I might make an approach. Uh, I should be passing west. Yeah, I don't have a visual on you yet. I'm just uh, a couple hundred feet. I'm about the level of the ridge line on the north end. Uh, but you can see these lake bed lines, all these horizontal lines across here. These are the shorelines of the yeah, old. You just barely passed uh, that trailer, didn't you? Bonneville. Uh, yeah, the one with the cutout kind of gravel pit looking thing. Yeah. I'm headed right towards the little saddle right before the large rise. The uh, on my birthday a couple years ago, we came out here and landed up here and then uh, did a, I was training for a run at the time, but uh, did a little run, ran up here, ran up to the ridge line, along the ridge line. What's your altitude? I'm uh, 5,300 right now. I'm going to stay on the west side of the ridge here. Okay. Uh, there are deer on this. Have you ever seen deer out here? I have. Oh, I got you now. Yes, yeah, so we climbed up here. I ran along this ridge line. And that little spot right there is one of my favorite little uh, landing spots. Traffic, six o'clock, low, one mile. I'm gonna cross the ridge to the east side. Okay, I'm north of you. I'm gonna pass you the saddle north of you. I'm barely below you though. Found your wake turbulence. Oh yeah? Yeah, it's not too bad. I love these cliffs on Stansbury. You can actually see these cliff bands all the way from the Salt Lake Valley. It's kind of Traffic, fun. Traffic, 7 o'clock, same cool altitude, when less when than you one mile. Been out no, here. I had you point as day until you turned against the mountain. Oh yeah? 
Oh uh, yeah, I've got you off to my left here. Yeah, as soon as you went through that saddle, you disappeared. It's surprising, I guess, that it's that hit, you know, but the, the color doesn't match, but... Here, I'm going to do some evasive maneuvers. Those are always fun. Now, if Todd were a jet fighter, I think I would duck below this bridge line here. You go back on the other side? I'm ducking down this little can little canyon here. My ears are popping. We're basically autoing. Aha, we've escaped. Ravens flying in there. Here's Stansbury Island. Beautiful place. Very few people. You can, uh, there is a uh, mountain biking trail. The road, you go drive out I 80 past Tooele, Grantsville. Uh, there's an exit off of I 80 out here. You take the road out, and there is a pretty good mountain biking trail uh, that goes up around here and goes along the shoreline on those uh, little terraces there. All right, we're headed back. Check my altitude on the fourth flight. Wait, what's Tuila's AOS? One one nine seven two five. Temperature two one Celsius two point four altimeter three zero two four mark dense. I'm headed towards the spit now at uh, forty nine hundred feet. You're harder to keep track of than an airplane for sure. Yeah. So if the hill uh, F-35s were scrambled, as long as I could be right near some island with things to duck down, I might get away. Oh, I think you probably would. What's your elevator right now? I'm at 4,840. In the, uh, at times of the year, I've seen people, you can see oh, you all these ATV tracks down below us. Sometimes I've seen people, uh, they set up a camp over there on Stansbury Island. And I'm then, to overtake you this time. Are you prefer me on your left or your right? Um, either way, Traffic probably left, then I can see Low. easier. Less than one mile. Okay. Uh, But I've seen people basically driving ATVs with wagons, and they uh, go over Your to this... turbulence is weird. It's more just like a... just rapid, but no no curve to it like an airplane. Oh, really? And uh, they go over to this island. They're gathering something. I don't know what it is. But uh, they gather it up, and uh, they haul it back and put I'm it in bags. About a quarter mile of a year. Seven o'clock. Traffic, six o'clock, same altitude, less than one mile. I went up and uh, pulled the power 
at 6,000 and pulled the prop all the way back and was just gliding around. And then I fed the prop back in and forgot to pull it back to cruise. I'm like, what's wrong with this thing? <laughs> How did it glide? A lot better than with the prop bite me. Yeah. There's Todd out on our left. Kind of a pretty view. Oh, you do flow, flow flight fairly well. Yeah, I slow down a little more than this. Just the nose is up. I'm, a, I'm about your 430, maybe. 200 feet above you. Yeah, I'm going to slowly sneak back up there. I put some flaps down. Traffic, 11 o'clock. sneak behind you, I'll see if I can get some video with my nose camera. Okay, I'll just hold this heading in this airspeed. Okay, I'm gonna join up behind here. I'm gonna be just above you. That's speed okay? Yeah, that's, that's good, I think. It looks cool from here. <laughs> I'm starting to get a bit of a shake here. Yeah, that looks pretty cool. What's your plan? Are you going back to Sky Park? Yeah, I'm going to head back over to Antelope and then cut across. All right, I'll see you a little bit later. I'm going to zip down to number two and see if Grant's there, then come back. Sounds good. Watch how he just disappears. <laughs> uh, that little plane Todd has, it's an RV6. Uh, fast little thing. He'll cruise around, you know, a couple hundred miles an hour, burning, uh, which is, you know, a hundred miles an hour faster than I am, burning uh, a third less fuel per hour uh, than I am. He's headed over there, he's going to cut right through the little mountain pass there, I bet you. All right, well, we're on the south end of the lake. We're on the home stretch here. Not too much farther. The good thing, we're going to time our gas just about perfect. With the reserve, of course. But man, we went a long ways here. Todd disappeared. 
Here's the south shore of the lake. This is where basically the Jordan River comes in. Salt Lake International Airport is right over there. Uh, if we called them, we could get a, uh, we could get, um, hang on, let me switch here. If we called them, we could get permission to uh, overfly the airport. But uh, I'm going to do another video where we just go up and do that. It's pretty cool. Uh, they basically route you, uh, they call it the I-80 transition. That's I-80, Interstate 80. And uh, you follow that in, you hit the little uh, uh, radio antenna there, KSL antenna. And then you cross right across the numbers of the two parallel runways. Uh, and uh, you'll see, you know, commercial jets and everybody taking off and landing right below you. It's pretty interesting. Okay, so now you're getting a good look at the other end of Antelope Island. I bet it's going to be a pretty sunset. You can see all the, there's a bunch of wispy clouds being pushed out of the west. Sometimes when we get these layers of clouds, right about sunset, the sun will dip just below that, illuminate all those clouds, reflecting off the lake and the clouds, and oh man, it's so pretty. We'll go down here and see if we can uh, spot any of the buffalo, whether they're on the east or west side. And uh, then we cut back across. The mud flats directly ahead are where we started this whole journey. And uh, I'll probably uh, wrap it up there. If you've made it this far, just drop a comment in the comments because I feel like I need to give you a pat on the back because it's a pretty long flight. I mean, you got to have a genuine interest in the Great Salt Lake. Cool traffic, traffic. 439, Bravo Foxtrot, just west of Stansbury Island at uh, 7,600, headed east. That's, uh... Cool traffic, traffic, 261, Sparta Lake for 35 at Altula. We'll be transitioning back to the east, heading back towards Salt Lake Tula. So a traffic meter 7668 uniform, I'm on the east side of Stansbury Island at uh, 6,500, just maneuvering to catch the ILS into 17. Switch back over to Sky Park. Actually, let's listen to uh, Salt Lake uh, International on the way. Uh, Salt Lake Tower. Actually, let's go approach south. 0.9. Alpine 1839, center maintain 9,000. Okay, we'll descend down here a little bit. Oh, that crane that I was telling you about earlier? That was stuck in the mud? That was right down here. So one thing they've had to do... How about 1839? No keep it close in for 3-4 uh, left, or if you wanted to extend a little bit, it would just be a little bit of an extension for 3-4 uh, right here. Your choice. Copy that, thanks. Uh, what they've had to do is basically, the uh, since this is all dried up now, makes it very easy for things like buffalo to wander right off the island. So they had to build a fence. The fence goes from all the way over here, cuts around the south end of the island, and goes all the way up north. And uh, I think they're going to have to extend the fence even longer pretty soon. Alpine 1839, just uh, advise when you're comfortable for a uh, comfortable with the base turn for three four left. Let's see, where are the buffalo? Alpine 1062, solid approach, Josh. Thanks, Roman three four left. I see a few of them. It looks like right on the ridge line right here. 
A call for. Alpha 1839, turn left heading 070. They clearly like that path. Because there's some well-worn paths right here. Number Niner 5 Echo, you're cleared to enter Bravo airspace via over or east of I-15. Maintain 6,000 while in Bravo airspace. Cleared to the Bravo over or east of I-15. Maintain 6,000 while in Bravo. Niner 5 Echo. Up on 1839, center maintain 7,000. But these are actually little shorelines of the oh, little lake, too. Two, two, one, these little six, flat stretches. One, about three miles. Three miles west of the Garfield stack. Full stop, Salt Lake information alpha. And flight 1062 to center maintain 9000. Outbound 1839, turn left heading 010 to join final cleared visual approach from 34 left. Down here to our right is uh, Garfield. Number 21621, Salt Lake approach, Glock 0327. Garfielding Ranch. Uh, was Zero, three, two, the seven, site two, of an early six, homestead two, out here, but it's got kind of a visitor center, approach, it's a good stopping point when you come out and visit. Alpha 1839, contact General 132.65, good day. And we'll go back to... I like to try to spot uh, antelope and stuff out here too, but they're a little harder to get to spot a lot of the time. There is some fresh water out here because here's a couple springs. As I understand it, at one time there was a uh, quite a herd of horses out here in the early uh, pioneer days, and supposedly some of the horses were just uh, just fantastic stock. All right, we've uh, almost reached our uh, return to the mud flats. So that's pretty much, uh, I'm gonna call that good for this video. So uh, thanks a lot for watching. And uh, if you like this, give it a like. I don't think most of my videos are gonna be quite this long, but given that uh, Salt Lake, uh, the Great Salt Lake has been in the news, and uh, it's such an unusual and interesting place. I thought uh, some people might like to see what it looks like firsthand. And, uh, you know, get to see a few places up a little closer than you otherwise would. Um, and a lot of the places we've flown over today are really actually just inaccessible uh, by a car. And, uh, even if they are accessible. It's long drives and uh, down a lot of roads I don't think uh, most people would want to drive down. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, thanks a lot for watching and uh, dry out. I'll be doing some other uh, interesting videos hopefully uh, in the near future. Thanks a lot. If I've still got this video. Okay, look at those lines again. Don't forget, if you know what those are from, I need you to tell me. Because what are they? Look at the way they make those little angles, curves. It's all going the same general direction, but it's all broken up. I don't get it. I don't know what that's from.